I would like to welcome you to the inaugural Mauricio Faber Lecture on Wellbeing, a new lecture series from the Office for Wellbeing, which is part of the Center for Faculty Development. I'm Miriam Bradella, and I'm the director of the Center for Faculty Development. And before I turn it over to Darshan Mehta, our director of the Office for Wellbeing, I would like to say a few words of gratitude to Mauricio Faber, after whom the lecture series is named. So we all know about Mauricio's extraordinary accomplishments as a leader, researcher, and clinician. But Maurizio is also one of the most supportive people that I have encountered at the MGH and also Harvard Medical School. So he has personally supported me in multiple endeavors and many of our initiatives in the CFD, including the Office for Wellbeing, which has its one year anniversary this month. And this only came to fruition through Mauricio's support. So thank you, Mauricio, for everything you have done and are doing for our faculty and trainees at the MGH and Harvard Medical School. And I am so honored to have your brother, Giovanni, with us today, even if it is only virtual. So now I would like to turn it over to Darshan Mehta, our director of the Office for Wellbeing. Darshan. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Miriam. And it's really an honor to be with all of you uh, this afternoon. My name is Darshan Mehta. I'm the director for the Office for Wellbeing and the Center for Faculty Development. And it's really uh, an honor for, uh, for all of us to be here to honor Maurizio and to really start off a, a series of dialogues on wellbeing. So um, I wanted to, uh, before just moving forward to introducing uh, both Maurizio uh, and uh, our guest of honor, um, want to just talk a little bit about our office and some of the activities so that uh, all of you are aware of some of what we're doing through this uh, office in the Center for Faculty Development. So our current Office for Wellbeing initiatives, if for those of you who uh, may already have been taking part in uh, some of these, and, and for those of you who are not aware, want you to be uh, aware of them, we've been uh, running uh, over the past year um, uh, every Monday from 8 to 8.30, uh, Meditation Mondays, and this is open to everybody in our community. Uh, and if there are any questions, just feel free to go on to the Center for Faculty Development website, uh, and you can just read, uh, sign on, and that's as easy as that. Uh, for those of you, uh, hopefully many of you have seen our, our um, TEDx MGH series, this has really been an amazing series of dialogues um, and by esteemed colleagues uh, who have been just uh, really quite courageous in sharing their journeys and stories. And these are our first four talks. We are rolling out a talk every, one, every month. And we're really, uh, these are really stories of ingenuity, of courage, of vulnerability that really share something about the human spirit. And, and I would encourage all of you to watch uh, these talks, if you haven't done so already, they're quite moving and quite inspiring. And hopefully we'll connect uh, one to, uh, to each other in very meaningful ways. Uh, we, um, we have been part of a group that is led by Dr. Carrie Palomara uh, and the employee well-being uh, sort of, uh, at, at Massachusetts General Hospital and this uh, new Apollo website has been rolled out over the past week. You've probably seen the blasts uh, that have gone out on this. And so if you haven't, we would encourage you to please look at this. Uh, this is an important resource uh, for all employees uh, at Mass General, uh, particularly, um, and, and really to find one sort of common space to uh, have resources around well-being in the workplace. And then our next initiative was really, uh, we've, uh, we just finished our first round of well-being grant recipients. Uh, these were really uh, small grants uh, that were awarded to faculty across different departments uh, in their own pursuit of well-being. And this was a pilot initiative, it was quite successful. Uh, here are our initial uh, grant recipients and, and those of you who are here, congratulations uh, to your um, uh, submission and, and, and award. And, and, and for those who uh, are looking for, we will have another round opening up on April 1, uh, and we intend to have a, a, a quarterly um, uh, submission opportunity for these well-being grants. But this has been really a successful, here's uh, our first um, round of grant recipients through the Office for Wellbeing. So thank you again 
for all of you that submitted. It really demonstrates some of the ingenuity and thank you. And again, congratulations to the recipients. So finally, um, uh, and, and, and importantly, it's my honor to really, uh, 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 to really uh, honor um, Dr. Maurizio Fava, as Miriam mentioned uh, early on, it was really his vision um, and advocacy for well being of the uh, MGH community that really created this office in the Center for Faculty Development. And, and as many of you know, uh, Dr. Maurizio Fava is the chief of psychiatry here at MGH. Uh, and, uh, and he, amongst many, many other uh, titles that he has, but I wanted to just give you a brief snapshot of all that he has achieved. Um, and this is really an intentional uh, <laughs> summary of his numerous accomplishments. He has mentored more than 50 trainees uh, who has gone on to become lead investigators in the area of psychiatry. He has um, uh, over five uh, with patents uh, to address the problem of excessive placebo response and drug trials. In 2009, he received the Clifford Barger Excellence in Mentoring Award from Harvard Medical School. And in 2013, the John Potts Faculty Mentoring Award. It really speaks to him as a mentor. He's the former president of the American Society of Clinical Psychopharmacology. And he is a well-known national and international leader, lecturer, writer, uh, and, um, uh, and just an, uh, an academic in all regards. But for me personally, I, I just wanted to share uh, and, and Maurizio may not remember, my first interaction was when I was a research fellow, uh, and this is over 15 years ago, and he invited me to come speak uh, to the research group uh, on a research idea I had. And little did he know, or maybe he didn't know, I don't know, but uh, where, uh, where the career trajectory has gone since then. And, but I was really grateful just for his I didn't really know, know who I was in the presence of at that time, but now the, <laughs> just the amazing amount of just um, kindness and just allowing people to grow in the ways that uh, they can. It's really been a, 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 a truly a, a place of humility. So uh, Dr. Fava, we wanted to thank you for all of your contributions and for your dedication to the well-being of the MGH community. Uh, and, um, and I was just sharing that, uh, you know, one of the things, uh, uh, I was just talking to my younger brother, um, and it's really beautiful to have this, uh, these images of family um, and, and how we guide one another as, as we get older uh, together, uh, both professionally and personally. And uh, so this is this Fava's courtesy of, of Dr. Giovanni Fava, the, the photos, but uh, uh, thank you again. And Maurizio, I'm gonna turn it over to you for, to share a few, a few words. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, and uh, uh, this is an incredible honor to, uh, you know, uh, Mass General is such an incredible institution. The people really of the institution make it unique. You make, make it a, a, an, an unbelievable experience to be part of it. And, and for that reason, the commitment that we all have towards the institution, we have to ensure that well-being is a focus of, of uh, uh, all the institution. And so the creation of an office of her well-being, I think is absolutely so important. So I'm very proud of, you know, Miriam's initiative with you, uh, Darshan, to create this office. And, uh, and hopefully this series uh, will really give the opportunity to uh, spread ways of, of us focusing on something that is important to all of us. We can't really uh, do our research or take care of patients or do what we do without a focus on our own well-being. So thank you for, for this. And uh, I'm delighted to see that my brother shared the picture. Uh, I was the little one in that picture, but thank you. <laughs> um, so uh, thank you, Maurizio, again. Uh, and. Um, uh, it's again, this is really a true treat for all of us. Um, so it is my honor to present um, uh, Dr. Giovanni Fava. I'm just going to turn back my slide just for a moment here. Um, he is the, as you can see, he also is, uh, has his own uh, unique and very distinguished set of accomplishments. He is professor of clinical psychology at the University of Bologna with a joint appointment at the State University of New York at Buffalo as clinical professor of psychiatry. Uh, 
also a prolific uh, writer, has authored more than 500 papers, has performed groundbreaking research, including an introduction of a novel psychotherapeutic approach while being therapy. He's editor in chief of psychotherapy and psychosomatics. And he will be presenting today. Um, and I'll just, without further ado, I would like to turn the floor over to Dr. Giovanni Fava. Thank you. Thank you very much <laughs> for this uh, uh, introduction and uh, this uh, uh, great opportunity for our uh, family uh, to, uh, to be together uh, in this uh, uh, initiative. And uh, what uh, uh, I'd like to do is to uh, uh, share with you uh, some journey. I mean, in these days that you cannot travel, that we are with the lockdown, uh, with all these things, I think it's important uh, uh, at least uh, to uh, remember uh, some journeys. Uh, um, and uh, uh, we start uh, uh, from a time which is uh, very, very distant uh, now. Uh, it was the summer of 74. Uh, I think uh, uh, many people in the audience were not even born. Um, I was a medical student in Italy, and uh, Maurizio was still in uh, high school. Um, and I had the opportunity uh, to spend the summer doing a clinical elective uh, at St. Joseph's Hospital in, uh, uh, in Hamilton, uh, Ontario. Uh, Tony, just to, just to interrupt you, are you going to share slides or are you going to... Oh, yes, yes. Because we can't see your slides. You have to share your screen. Okay. Yeah, good night. That's what the younger brother has to do is to... Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, let's see how... Okay, uh, I forgot to. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Let's uh, see. You, you have to select the slides, Joanny. Okay. Uh, can you see the slide? Yes, but you, you now I have to click on the. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. yeah. Oh, <laughs> so sad. <laughs> yeah, my brother is always the. It's always been more technological <laughs> than than uh, than uh, I am. So uh, again, we, we start from this slide. Uh, uh, Saint Joseph Hospital, summer '74, and Mauricio coming along. Uh, uh, his excuse was uh, uh, that uh, he, was, he did attend uh, what is called in Italy classical lyceum. A very uh, uh, useful type of high school. Main subjects uh, uh, are Latin and ancient Greek, no English. And uh, uh, and Maurizio wanted uh, to come uh, to uh, North America uh, for studying English because uh, his intention was to study economics. So he said, "Yeah, well, if I get into economics, uh, I need." Uh, to have a command of English. So we were there together in Hamilton, and I was very fortunate to have uh, an outstanding clinician, uh, George Molna, who had come from Europe uh, to Canada, as uh, uh, many other uh, medical scientists. Uh, and I was having uh, a fantastic time with him. Uh, at the end of, uh, of the summer, uh, George Molnar um, uh, made a suggestion to, to me, said, uh, why, I see you're very interested in research, but why don't you spend next summer in the Department of Clinical Epidemiology and Biostatistics and learn a lot about the research? Um, uh, yes, McMaster had uh, 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 that unit, I went there, it was very interesting. In a few years, that unit uh, would have become famous for launching evidence-based medicine. But there was a remark of Jordan Molnar, uh, which uh, turned me off. He said, well, they are doing very nice research, but uh, they have no idea of uh, what's going on in the real world. You see, 
as uh, many other people of my generation, uh, we wanted to change the world. Uh, and I was not particularly attracted uh, to something which was outside of the world. So with Mauricio, uh, uh, we decided uh, to take advantage of a Canadian holiday to take the bus and going to explore another place. You see, in those days, there was no internet, nothing. I mean, so if you had a chance, the best thing to find to find out about places was to knock on the door. So we took the bus and uh, direction and destination, Rochester, New York. Uh, not very far from Hamilton. And the person I wanted to meet was George Andrew. Uh, because I had read uh, um, some of his papers, uh, particularly this paper, uh, which was published in 1960, uh, uh, in my opinion, his best paper, uh, where he formulated uh, a criticism of the traditional concept of disease and presented a revolutionary unified concept of health and disease. Uh, <clears throat> in a few years, uh, uh, George Engel, who uh, would have published uh, his famous paper on the biopsychosocial uh, model and became the manifesto of the psychosomatic movement. I went to the unit, uh, couldn't speak with uh, George Engel, but uh, spoke with uh, Ash Foley, and we <clears throat> arranged for me to come back the following summer and to spend the summer with them. So, when uh, uh, Maurizio and I took the bus to Hampton, I was sharing with him uh, my enthusiasm. Uh, this is really uh, the place where I wanted to be. Uh, this is the future uh, 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 I, I like uh, to have. And I was sharing with him all this uh, 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 enthusiasm. And I remember Maurizio, at a certain point, uh, uh, stop me and say, I have to tell you something very important. And I say, no, younger, older brother, okay, what do you have? Uh, and Maurizio said, uh, uh, I'm not going to economics uh, any longer. I want to go into medicine. Uh, and uh, uh, if a passenger in the bus listening to our conversation and said to me, uh, one day when uh, your brother is going to be 64, many years from now, uh, you're going to give uh, Maurizio Fava lectures. I said, come on, <laughs> uh, you've got to be kidding. Uh, who are you, Sergeant Pepper? Uh, but here I am delivering this lecture. Let's talk about uh, another journey. Uh, this is Mary Yahoda, and the name may be uh, not saying much uh, to you. She also grew up uh, in a very splitting environment, Vienna, at the beginning of uh, the past century, and got a PhD in psychology there, and you can think of Vienna uh, philosophy, art, literature in those days. And Giovanni, do you, may things... to get, you may want to get closer to the microphone because okay. we okay. don't hear it as well. Okay, I will. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, okay. Uh, um, so there was, uh, 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 she got the PhD, but uh, um, Vienna was not the most suitable place for her uh, because uh, she was a socialist, she was Jewish, and she was a woman. Uh, she was able to escape from Vienna, uh, went to England, uh, then after the war, went to the States, uh, became a professor of social psychology at NYU, uh, then she got tired of American academic life, went back to England, left psychology, 
and became one of the most brilliant minds of the Laborist Party uh, in England. But <clears throat> before leaving psychology, uh, she wrote a book in 58. Uh, in my opinion, the most important book of mental health ever written. Um, you can download, uh, by the way, the book uh, uh, for free. Uh, it, it was a revolutionary book uh, where she presented uh, her model of psychological well being. Uh, was saying that mental health was shifted to psychological dysfunction. And uh, she um, outlined uh, certain dimensions of psychological well being, which we are going to uh, describe uh, in, in a minute, uh, and the importance of the balance and integration of psychological forces. And there was a very important remark. In that book, you say, okay, one form of success is uh, decreasing or eliminating the spread. But uh, what we need to do is now to make a psychological well being uh, grow, uh, which is a very nice concept. But the problem is uh, how. 20 years later, after our trip to Rochester, New York, and Mauricio was in Boston at MGH. And I was in Bologna, and I was actually uh, evaluating uh, uh, the patients, uh, philosophy students with a severe, very severe obsessive compulsive disorder. Uh, he had been treated with medications. Uh, uh, he also underwent uh, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, which is uh, the therapy that is uh, uh, mostly uh, recommended for these disorders, uh, but uh, with very little uh, uh, success and even got worse. So after seeing this patient, I thought, well, what can I do for him? Uh, um, I thought of something. I mean, cognitive therapy, I mean, the basic uh, uh, principle uh, is that the use of the diary, uh, modern psychotherapy is essentially a self, uh, a guided self therapy. So you use the diary, you write down the negative situations and then the automatic thoughts and the distress. Uh, and I thought, why don't we take a, a different uh, role? Uh, we ask, uh, people to write down positive situations, the feeling of well-being, and uh, and what stops the feeling of well-being, uh, and this is the, how I uh, came up about uh, well-being therapy, which is uh, this uh, uh, psychotherapeutic approach uh, that is mainly based uh, on self-observation of well-being. As a matter of fact, it is essentially the only psychotherapeutic approach that is based on monitoring of well-being, use of fracture, diary, and homework. Uh, just to give you uh, a very um, you know, rough idea, there are initial sessions with monitoring of well-being, then uh, the person uh, uh, discovers uh, what uh, leads uh, to the interruption of well-being. And then uh, you try to suggest uh, different ways of approaching uh, uh, the situations and, uh, and what, uh, um, what the patients uh, perceive. And, uh, um, people have uh, to look for optimal experiences. Let me give you uh, just uh, a, 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 a quick look uh, at what is a, a, an optimal experience. Uh, it's, I think it's something we all know, is the fact uh, that you're doing something that uh, uh, is challenging, uh, uh, that takes you completely time flies, uh, 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 provides clear goals, uh, and uh, you do it for your own sake, uh, regardless of outcome. There may be something 
related to hobbies, to sports. Uh, we are so different about it. Uh, those of, of us working in an academic field have even the privilege of having optimal experiences. Uh, something that you really like to do. For me, for instance, uh, an optimal experience uh, is to write an exceptional book uh, that, uh, uh, where I try to combine clinical issues, the literature, the experience. And, uh, and with uh, optimal experience, you recharge your batteries. And for me, uh, it, it makes possible uh, to tolerate uh, dreadful situations such as committing with this. Uh, but let's have a look at this dimension. And let's start from the first, environmental mastery. I want you to uh, have a look at, at uh, uh, the central uh, uh, level, balance, functional. Environmental mastery uh, means that you have a sense of competence in managing the environment. You control external activities. Uh, uh, you make effective use of uh, surrounding uh, opportunities. But uh, look on the left, uh, look uh, at uh, 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 the low level of uh, impair level of environmental uh, mastery. The fact that you have uh, uh, feelings, uh, difficulties uh, in managing uh, everyday situations uh, that uh, uh, you, you, you lack sense of control. But uh, uh, it's not true that the more the better, and you will realize immediately that well being therapy has very little to do with positive psychology. Because also excessive levels are, are not very good, uh, because you are always looking for challenges uh, and not. Uh, 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 able to relax. For instance, I remember uh, when I was a fourth year resident in psychiatry in Italy, I had the opportunity of spending uh, one year in an American medical center. And I was told I was going to uh, do some clinical work. But then I found myself as an attending in an inpatient unit. And uh, uh, so anything on the left column, that was me uh, at, that, at that time, overwhelmed. But uh, 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 building environmental mastery is part uh, of building your clinical competence. And you do that with something that in well-being therapy we call transfer of experience that is the ability to identify the similarities between events and situations that were handled successfully in the past and those that are about uh, to come. Um, for instance, a student who has a certain level of anxiety, the first exams he takes at the university at the same level of anxiety um, toward the end means that has very little transfer of this experience. And uh, so you see, it's very much environmental mastery is very much connected with personal growth. Uh, the other dimension by Mary uh, Again, let's look in the middle, uh, in the central part, uh, with a balanced level, a feeling of continued development, uh, seeing uh, uh, self as growing and expanding. And let's look now uh, at the low level, a uh, sense of personal stagnation, um, feeling bored, uh, like sense of improvement. Uh, for um, very reason, I happen to see many colleagues uh, as patients. Uh, and uh, particularly the mental health field, what is generally called burnout or something with similar connotation, uh, I found that it's essentially very low personal growth. But also an excessive level is not 
uh, because you are unable to process uh, negative issues uh, in the, um, um, for instance, in your work as a physician or in your academic uh, life. And you set uh, a realistic standard. Uh, another dimension that is, uh, I'm talking about this dimension particularly in, in the field of academic medicine, what they may mean to each of us. And uh, 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 you see purpose in life. Um, again, let's go uh, in the central uh, part of the slides, uh, having uh, purpose and meaning uh, to present uh, and, uh, and uh, past life, uh, a future to believe in substantially. And low level, in, instead you have uh, you lack the sense of meaning. You don't see any sense of direction, uh, purpose, uh, and uh, an excessive level <clears throat> is uh, uh, when you have really some uh, obsessional passions uh, and rigidity. You see, purpose in life, uh, uh, in in academic in medicine, in my opinion. It's not simply, I mean, this is life after funding. I mean, it's not uh, simply uh, to get, uh, uh, to make a career, to get a recognition, but to really have something you want to, uh, to explore and to share with other people, which brings <clears throat> to another dimension uh, that is autonomy. Uh, Again, the middle, it's uh, nice to be self-determining, to resist the social pressures, uh, uh, to regulate behavior from within. And uh, it's not that good to have a low dimension uh, where we are over concerned with the expectations and evaluation of others. <clears throat> and we rely on judgment of others, uh, as well as uh, you may have trouble uh, with excessive level of autonomy. And these are people who are not able to work in team uh, uh, and are not able to ask for help or advice in certain situations. So again, you see, we are in the middle, but uh, this thing seems very simple. But if you are in academic medicine today, uh, when uh, uh, we have the decline of plural, where social conformity is rewarded, as well as the cult of mediocrity, if you have new ideas that are not mainstream, uh, you may encounter a lot, a lot of problems, uh, uh, getting through a lot of frustration. <clears throat> And always I had these problems, but today, in my opinion, uh, this editorial I wrote uh, uh, probably even more. And uh, let's go at uh, the two last uh, dimensions that are uh, also very important in academic medicine for the faculty. One is self acceptance. Uh, self acceptance is so substantial, is that you accept yourself with good and bad qualities. Uh, and uh, low level, you feel dissatisfied with uh, yourself, with you, you wish to be different, uh, uh, excessive level, um, you know, narcissist, uh, difficulties in admitting mistakes, rigidity. Uh, I'm sure you have a lot of examples in mind. Uh, and let's look at the positive uh, relations with uh, others. It's the last but not the least, uh, the fact of developing warm and trusting relationships with others, uh, uh, being capable of strong empathy. And uh, if you look at low level on the left, uh, uh, these difficulties, uh, this uh, uh, inability to make compromises, to sustain important ties, uh, this difficulty in communicate, communication, this is uh, central to the clinical work. If you are able to establish uh, 
a therapeutic relationship uh, with, uh, uh, with the patient. Uh, but of course, there is also the other part, the excessive level uh, may bring you to <coughs> exaggerated empathy. <coughs> and when you sacrifice your needs to the well being uh, for those uh, uh, of others, uh, and uh, in, in the past year, in this dramatic year, we have really seen all the heroes that uh, the medical profession has been able to, uh, to, to display. But then there is, uh, there is the cost. Uh, uh, let me just mention that some Chinese colleagues uh, are doing <clears throat> a major trial of well-being therapy applied to medical personnel uh, who uh, became exhausted after uh, the epidemic. Uh, so uh, we see that we have these uh, uh, dimensions, but what really matters is their integration. Uh, and at that point, uh, I thought, well, is it really correct that we still talk about psychological well-being, uh, happiness, life satisfaction, or uh, uh, things like uh, this. So uh, with a friend of mine, you see, academic medicine is also uh, the place of uh, very important uh, friendship. And a friend of mine, her back, a Danish investigator, and we had uh, <clears throat> uh, at least uh, two issues in common, two things in common. One, uh, we had already a Holder school, and appreciated. And the second, we both knew Greek uh, because of the, our high schools. And so we uh, brought forward the, the concept of new time. Uh, well, what, what does this word mean? Uh, we, we made a definition um, that was very different from what uh, 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 had occurred in, in medicine, particularly in psychiatry. In psychiatry, you use the term euthania when in bipolar disorder, if the patient is not uh, manic or not depressed, it's euthanic, which, which is not even true because uh, subclinical uh, uh, fluctuations are, are the rule. So we <coughs> uh, try to outline this concept uh, as lack of uh, mood. Uh, uh, disturbances, okay, that is one thing, but it's only one thing. And the fact that the subject is positive, active, uh, feel cheerful, calm, active, interested in things. And the subject, uh, the third component that manifests psychological well being in a whole sense, a flexibility, a unified look of life, which has actions, uh, consistency. And resistance to stress. Uh, you see, euthania comes from Greek, and uh, uh, it uh, it comes from uh, uh, eo, which means well, and simos, which means soul, will, desire, uh, a lot of different uh, issues that, that were part of uh, of Greek uh, uh, philosophy and definition. So. <clears throat> but there is also something very interesting, uh, and uh, these are various philosophers, that the verb of Elzibos, uh, Elzimeo, <clears throat> uh, means, in Greek, means both I'm happy, in good spirit, and I make other people happy, I reassure and encourage. Is, this, is there anything better than this? Uh, uh, definition that this verb for uh, our medical profession. But the uh, empty mail <clears throat> means also another thing that I can transmit you, Tanya. And so let me just uh, uh, mention uh, three studies we did in Italy. Uh, mm, these were uh, studies that were performed with well being therapy in schools. These were uh, three <coughs> randomized controlled trials. <laughs> How do you do such a study in school? Uh, 
Well, uh, you do it if you assign certain classes of well-being and you have a, a passion for SIBO groups uh, where you have uh, students simply uh, uh, discussing about matters. Uh, and in these studies, one was in primary school, one in middle school, one high school. Um, uh, we uh, observe significant um, benefits in terms of interpersonal relationship and personal growth uh, after well-being therapy. And much to my surprise, I must say, uh, these uh, 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 benefits uh, persisted at uh, 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 six months follow-up. So <clears throat> it's important to recognize that, uh, uh, yes, schools uh, uh, <clears throat> are for developing learning and educational processes, but also for facilitating human and social development. <clears throat> and we are, we realize this now with the lockdown when the schools <clears throat> are closed. So we, we now realize how important they are for children. And the aims of educational settings may be uh, the prevention of childhood psychological disorders by promoting uh, youth time. Uh, but then we went on with this uh, concept <clears throat> with the uh, uh, help uh, with, of uh, uh, clinical psychologist uh, in, uh, at the University of Bologna, uh, Jenny Guidi, uh, we further uh, 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 develop uh, assessment instruments for Utania and uh, uh, assessment and treatment strategies. Um, uh, I must say that uh, uh, Jenny uh, Guidi was uh, uh, an, an ideal partner, not only because she knew uh, Yahoda's book or she studies, uh, uh, she studied Greek uh, uh, at school, but also because she spent part of uh, her PhD at MGH uh, working with uh, uh, George Papakostas. So her Greek uh, credentials were really very, very strong. And we could go on uh, and uh, uh, try to outline. Uh, we wrote this paper in, in Word uh, uh, that was published in Word uh, <coughs> Psychiatry, which is the top journal in psychiatry in factor of 40. Uh, and the editor uh, decided to have a number of commentaries and to dedicate <coughs> a lot of time uh, a lot of space uh, to this concept, uh, which was thought to be a sort of a revolution. But uh, what I like to state uh, today is that uh, in the pursuit of eutymia is not simply something that applies to clinical settings. And it's not something related, strictly related to what we have It's a general perspective that should involve both patients and doctors. And uh, <clears throat> you see, in preparing uh, this lecture and, and, and setting the slide, uh, I made uh, uh, a discovery. After, I mean, this is okay, this is a revolutionary perspective, something, but after all, this is uh, again what George Hendon, uh, with her uh, postulated. Uh, with uh, his uh, unified concept uh, of uh, uh, health uh, uh, and disease. And uh, another thing that uh, I have uh, uh, realized uh, is that uh, my brother Maurizio and I are still in that bus, going from Rochester to Hamilton, talking about the future and dreaming of a different method. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you Virtual so much. Virtual applause. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> thank you so much, Giovanni, for those wonderful comments. If you can um, unshare your screen and then we can, that way everyone can see everybody. 
Uh, and wanted to, we have a few questions uh, that have come through the chat um, as well. For, for Michael, if you're able to unshare the screen, that would be fine yeah, too. Thank, okay. you. thank you. Perfect. So uh, again, very stimulating and very relevant and, and uh, certainly as an important um, uh, part of just uh, how we inaugurate these, these, this uh, talk series. One uh, question that just emerged, uh, came up was, you know, how do you reconcile uh, some aspects of well-being, like uh, when people you encourage people to take risks, so autonomy, personal growth, but it could be incongruent with other aspects, uh, like sense of self-purpose in life, positive relations with others. And this is often comes up in academia, where there may be an incongruence. And so how do you, uh, how do you what, what do you say to that, uh, that sort of potential conflict? That may be there. Uh, <clears throat> yes, uh, thank you for this question. It's a very important point. Uh, you see, uh, first of all, um, each one of us uh, should have uh, his or her uh, individualized uh, uh, balance. Uh, in other words, it's wrong to think of something that is good to everyone. Um, for instance, you may have frustration, as I said, in autonomy. But you can tolerate those frustrations if you have a strong purpose in that. And if you have some very uh, good uh, positive relationship with others who encourage you, will say, okay, go on. Uh, um, uh, um, it's, uh, I, I remember I, I was uh, 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 presented something that uh, at that time was very. <laughs> very daring uh, about antidepressant drug. And once I, uh, I spoke with uh, a very um, experienced uh, psychopharmacologist and he said, okay, uh, and he asked me, how, how old are you? And I didn't understand the question. And then he said, okay, in 20 years, uh, your ideas may find some <laughs> recognition. So uh, it's so, and, and I remember him, uh, 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 same deal. So you need to find your own balance uh, about different things. It's not the same for everyone. And uh, many times if you concentrate too much on one of these dimensions, this uh, creates problems for others. Thank you. Um, so I'm, I'm going to ask a follow-up uh, question, just thinking about the role of um, in academia, mentorship is such an important part of well-being, and and maybe I'll first, uh, Giovanni, I'll ask the question to you and, and thinking about the role of being mentored and as well as well as being a mentor. How do both of those contribute to your sense of well-being? And then I'll also maybe ask Maurizio to give a couple of thoughts on his role, uh, thinking about this concept um, as well. Well, <clears throat> you see, it's. Uh... Uh, the point uh, is that uh, well, when I spoke uh, about environmental mastery and at the beginning you have to build up the environmental mastery uh, uh, and to say even more, if you feel you have a complete environmental mastery at the very beginning, that's a bad start. That's a bad start. Uh, so you have to build it up. And you need someone who could help you doing this. But uh, by doing uh, uh, this, you get uh, an incredible uh, satisfaction. For instance, uh, let me share with you simply uh, my work as a journal editor. Our uh, um, journal uh, is <laughs> uh, concerned with innovations. So uh, we publish a lot of uh, uh, innovative papers uh, by young people. And of course it's a risk, but when we are able uh, to succeed uh, and to make uh, certain uh, issues known, that's, that's really a big reward and a big uh, satisfaction. Let's see what Maurizio has to say about this. No, I, I agree uh, with Giovanni that, you know, the uh, uh, mentorship in some ways is an opportunity to leverage your own environmental mastery to create a positive relationship with others and in, in some ways uh, 
to derive a great sense of satisfaction and pleasure from helping others. So I think that, you know, um, and, 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 and the mentorship is bi-directional because as you mentor, you're also learning from the mentee. So it, it's a never ending process that is highly rewarding in the academic world uh, because you get, you, you get the benefit of being mentored, you mentor and you get mentorship from the, back from the mentee. So it's a great process. Yeah, <laughs> let me add this also. It's uh, uh, like uh, in a, a novel by Balzac uh, in the academic uh, world, we see the best and the worst. Uh, <laughs> we see uh, uh, incredible things. So you really have to stick to the best to go on. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, one question that um, came up, um, and I, you mentioned some of the work that uh, early on that has to happen in the school environments and, and, and such, and just thinking about uh, examples of other clinical interventions or uh, ways in which you've been able to operationalize well-being therapy with patients. <clears throat> oh, okay. I, I, didn't, uh, uh, I didn't talk about uh, the clinical applications of well-being therapy, uh, which are substantially based uh, uh, I mean, the, the evidence is on relapse prevention in depression. Uh, if you are able to increase well-being, the patient is uh, less likely uh, to relapse. Uh, and uh, increasing uh, the level of uh, 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 recovery, um, uh, something that, for instance, uh, we uh, forget, uh, and Mary Hauda already outlined that, uh, is that uh, if patients uh, uh, if you are able to eliminate uh, distress in a patient, many times uh, the patient gets in a sort uh, of limbo. I mean, no good, no, no bad. So you need to do something more. And uh, so these are the two main areas where well-being therapy has been applied uh, clinically. Wonderful. Um... Again, uh, I think in a related way, uh, in thinking about, you again, mentioning schools, one of the questions that just came up was, what are your thoughts about teaching people to cultivate well-being from early in life? And what are the, four, I guess I'll ask a corollary, what are the different forces that are responsible, uh, both obviously at the individual and sort of family unit levels, but then thinking at the societal level to cultivate well-being from early in life? Oh, well, <laughs> yes, I mean, of course, this is a, a, a different, uh, a different uh, a way of cultivating well-being. The photo <laughs> you put at the very beginning uh, of us, uh, uh, Maurizio and our older sister, Elisabetta, uh, together, definitely our parents were, <laughs> were, were putting uh, well-being. Uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, so, that that part is uh, in, in the family is very important. But let me just make a remark uh, um, that uh, a 13 year old girl made uh, uh, after one of the studies, uh, and she said she asked, "Why is no one talking about this issue? Why we never heard about uh, uh, <laughs> these matters, interpersonal relationships?" The importance and purpose. Why? So I think that uh, there is a lot, uh, uh, a lot, uh, a lot to be done uh, about this, uh, and uh, uh, um, it's something that uh, it's also connected with uh, 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 a lifestyle than uh, in the So uh, it, it could be a major uh, factor. Oh, um, one of the questions that is sort of um, uh, just was asked was thinking about how is well-being therapy similar to or different from sort of the current um, excitement and trends in positive psychology that we see? Are, they, are, are we talking synonymously or are there some distinctions that we should understand between them? Okay. Uh, um, no, it, it's quite different. It's quite different. I mean, the, the first thing is that uh, 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 it's not uh, uh, positive psychology, uh, unfortunately, is very simplistic in, in many 
uh, it doesn't uh, really get uh, to the complexity of the inverse situation. So our point is that these uh, dimensions of well-being uh, are by themselves neither positive or negative. Uh, it, it, uh, it really it's something much uh, much more uh, complex. Okay, I mean the, there are a lot of things uh, in positive psychology <laughs> uh, that uh, that may be important. But the perspective is very is very uh, different, uh, and also uh, I don't want to get into Greek philosophy, uh, which would be very interesting, by the way, uh, issue. But it's it's quite uh, it's, it's quite. Easy. And maybe one, uh, I'll ask sort of one uh, question, and sort of as it pertains to our work in the Center for Faculty Development. We're focused, uh, part of the role of the Center Faculty Dome is also focused on academic promotion and the role of academic promotion. How, does, how do you feel that is perhaps um, contributes to well being or detracts from well being in this pursuit of academic promotion, especially in an academic medical center like, like ours here at MGH? Okay, well, what I said, uh, uh, there is uh, uh, life after. Uh, funding and uh, uh, after academic promotion. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that, but uh, uh, in my opinion, uh, you should put in terms of uh, purpose of life, uh, other things in perspective. Uh, uh, there might be things which uh, people do not really acknowledge uh, uh, very much about, which are of optimal experiences for you and are important for other people. So we should uh, pay attention. Um, so again, uh, on behalf of the Center for Faculty Development, I wanna really thank you, Dr. Giovanni Fava, for really launching this series and, and Dr. Maurizio Fava, thank you for your uh, continuous presence and, and advocacy for well-being. Uh, certainly here at MGH, but obviously in academia, broadly speaking. Um, uh, this has really been an amazing uh, set of conversations and also at a very personal level, just wonderful to see this brotherly love and spirit that uh, certainly has motive inspired each other. So it's really, it's palpable. And, and even through Zoom, we can feel it across, across continents, uh, as we say. So thank you again. Um, and uh, and again, I would encourage all of you, please uh, do take advantage of all the different um, opportunities and uh, support that we can provide through the Center for Faculty Development. It's all on our Center for Faculty Development uh, webpage uh, that you can um, easily access. Um, uh, Miriam, any other final comments? Thank you so much, Giovanni, for this really inspiring lecture. And it gave me some new ideas what we can do in the center. Also gave me some ideas what to do at home with my kids. So thank you. And I would like to thank our audience. We had an amazing turnout for this lecture. So thank you very much. And they were great questions and comments. So um, we will, that inspires me and in our office to keep working on our well being. So thank you, everyone. And I just mentioned somebody had asked about slides and stuff. The, the lecture is recorded. And, uh, yeah. and so it will be available on the Center for Faculty Development website. Yes. Thank you, Dasha. Yeah. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.